Oh wait, here Camille is here. Uh, Annette uh, got us some information on the uh, on Angus. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you want to summarize that, uh, Annette, or just uh, some yeah. of the? Uh, yeah. Hi, That's Camilla. Cool. Nice to see you. Tim is here. Well, Tim, Tim was wanted to hear it too. So, okay, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, well, um, I can put in the chat. It's it's wandering Angus by the Water Boys, mm -hmm. and um, it's about more or less the, the story of the the swans. Angus is wandering, and um, he he has the anima in his dreams. His anima is Kaher. She sings to him in his dreams, and he has this beautiful swan song. And then. Um, he has to find her and then his father encourages him to actually really find her in in the real world mm -hmm. so but he's afraid to mix up the dream world and um, and the real world of course so it mm -hmm. takes him three years and then finally his brother finds her in a swan lake and um, then of course she is the daughter of the fairy king and the fairy king says um, she's wild and uh, good luck if you want to win the hand of my daughter, you know, she mm -hmm. will make her own decision. And uh, uh, so that's, uh, you know, and then Angus has to, um, he discovers that she transforms herself just before the winter into a swan and he has to meet her at that point of transformation. Mm -hmm. And um, he finds her then, but he's a little bit late. And when he finds her, there are about a thousand swans and she is one of them. So the, the song is then that he has to find the right anima amongst all these swans. Because he, yeah, because he in his life has loved many the animas and now he has to find the right anima, you know. That's the mm -hmm. challenge she puts out to, to him. And um, so, uh, and then... Um, he finds her after he's scared, but he closes his eyes and he remembers the swan song. And then with that, he finds her. And then, uh, he, yeah, she demands, of course, that he also has to join her in her world. So he has to become a swan as well. And he is um, the biggest thing, I think, in this. And then you get the sweet part, you know, the, the, the two swans. Yeah. together. The two swans that form a heart. Yes. yes. And there's many varieties in Ireland of songs. Like there's also Raglan Road, the one I also send you. It's quite beautiful, I think, as well. That's also about an earthly uh, anima. But that mm -hmm. is the song of a man who, um, who doesn't have the courage to get into action. And uh, he, he dreams, he dreams. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. I've got all kinds of noises like that all day long. <laughs> Well, it, yeah, it's just uh, um, the, the Celtic uh, ones are particularly uh, powerful. And and see, the, the one thing that she's going to, oh, well, why don't you finish? Yeah, go ahead, Annette. So with the earthly one, it's I can put the titles in the chat and then you can find yes. it. There's many, many artists have done it, you know. And that's, it has beautiful lyrics. And then they meet again uh, as old ghosts in the street, but they recognize each other, but they admit that they have never had the courage. Both of them had never had the courage to connect. And yeah. it's very, very sad, but beautiful, you know? Well, you, you know, thank you, Annette. That's, uh, it's just absolutely wonderful uh, that, that the, to get that uh, more uh, uh, nuance on that because uh, Jan is here, great. Um, I just wanted to, hi, Angel and Camilla, welcome. Uh, any, uh, Camilla, I don't know, you may have been here before, but if you haven't, you can put your uh, email in the chat. But- Okay, uh, hello. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Where are you from Hawaii, is that right? No, I'm from Denmark, but I live oh, in Denmark. Sweden, in Malmö. Okay, great. Well, yeah, we're just, um, we're gonna be discussing um, today uh, uh, something that is uh, has a lot of Nordic <laughs> elements in it. You know, my fa father comes from Norway 
And uh, okay. so I really, uh, you know. Uh, That's great. That, yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can sort of read Dan Danish. I can't really uh, speak. I can speak Norwegian and I can read Danish and a little bit of Swedish, but um, I, it's hard for me to understand spoken. Uh, uh, yes. yes, there's a lot of throaty sounds anyway, that uh, well, yeah. sort of shortened words and all that. But nice yeah, to meet you. It's the first time I attend, and but I know of Jungian analysis. I've been in for a long time and I'm studying it a bit as, as well now. Yeah, well, so, great, great, great to have you. You know, one of the you. things we're, we're reading, and I'll put it, uh, if you get in the email, I'll uh, get you yeah. the Animus and Anima by Emma Young. But I'm uh, the one thing I'm saying about this, this is for the first time. I mean, the way that she approaches this. And by the way, hi, Tim, and uh, Miles, and Angel, and Jan, and uh, your. Uh, uh, yeah, who else? I, I, my darn glasses are giving me up here. Oh, and Yog, uh, Yogar, uh, yeah, hi, Yogar. I thought you might have been Jordy, but uh, nice to have you here too. If you uh, you, if you put your email in the chat, we'll send you the text. But what what we're gonna do here, uh, Camilla, is is something that I, that has really been uh, uh, just a revelation to me from this book is what what the anima really is because she is uh, the the original title of this book in german is natur wesen and it means nature being okay and what we we and and I, following this book I, I think we almost have to read james hillman's anima you know the anatomy of a personified notion because he's going to tell us the difference between a nature being, the feeling function, and the feeling function, is it related to valuation or is it relatedness? Because there's two different types. Eros, Eros, where, where uh, the anima has this historical um, relationship to myth and legend of the, uh, of the, uh, of really these nature beings, uh, because um, I, I, first I, I want to show you just a couple, introduce it, and then we'll get right into the uh, things. First of all, this this is kind of um, tells us a little bit about the nature beings. This is from Maurice Egan, and you know this all came out started in the Romantic period where people started to sense that nature was informed by soul. You know, the actual, uh, what they had seen in nature, seen uh, the forms of nature, the, the different flora and fauna and all that, there was a wisdom behind it and that they felt that this own wisdom was in them. And this mysterious relationship between nature and, uh, and spirit, you know, uh, and uh, uh, the fact that um, I'm going to get to this, but, but it says a pagan heart, a Christian soul, had he, he followed Christ, yet for dead pan he sighed. You know, um, that was, uh, that's just, a, I think that really is, is something that awakens an energy in all of us, you know. But um, the, the other aspect, this, um, what, what is uh, I, I want, first? I want to show you this little diagram that that Hillman uh, sets out, which is uh, I think uh, it, to me it was just complete revel revelation. You know, uh, let me see if I can find this. Oh darn it! This thing's giving me. Hold on. Okay. Okay is uh, this diagram here. Now this, this think about this here. First of all, uh, Hillman uses this um, analogy of Plato's cave, okay? The allegory of Plato's cave. You've all heard it where there's people um, who are chained uh, in front of a wall and these shadows um, 
uh, the, the fire behind puts the shadows on the wall and they think this is reality, you know. And then um, up the, the world above, uh, uh, outside of it is the genuine awareness. This is a secondary awareness. And what Hillman says is, you know, the, the, the cave awareness that's highly valued by the ego and seems to possess uh, masculine energies uh, in his outer world is choice, the freedom of choice, you know, and uh, light, you know, the light of ego, problem solving, reality testing, strengthening ego, developing ego, controlling nature, and pro progress. These, these are the, uh, the qualities that are highly valued by the ego. But what Hillman says is genuine awareness is, is as far as the ego is concerned, is worthless, it's rejected. It is feminine energies. This has nothing to do with the woman, okay? It has to do with um, a, a, the re receiving, being in the present moment. It has more to do with the Tao than it does a, a woman, you know? It, it is the, the, uh, the um, receiving, being present in this moment, not in the past or the future, um, being able to accept life without willfulness, willful rebellion, you know? And uh, these are the feminine energies. The masculine energies are more of the hero archetype, you know? But uh, just listen to the words, the, the visionary, the realm of images, which the unconscious is, the reflection, this is something that um, uh, that Marion Woodman stresses um, that you write down what happens during the day and reflect upon it. You know, this is a feminine thing to do. Uh, insight, that means you're open to the intuitive world, this mirroring aspect, um, uh, holding, brooding on something. Don't decide right now. Sleep on it. Uh, sleep on it a couple of days. Then you'll the answer comes to you. You don't have to uh, choose between two. The answer becomes a natural decision, not uh, 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 digesting things. You know, uh, this is this is uh, the Buddha sat for seven days. Then he stood and looked at the place he sat. Relating, integrating, relating, integrating. You know, this is digesting, you know, and then um, echoing and deepening. Now, I'm not exactly sure I can define all those terms, but that's genuine awareness and it's feminine. The, the cave awareness is this more uh, direct approach, you know. And he also makes this wonderful statement. And then we're going to get into Emma Young and nature beings, not Dr. Wesson. Is, uh, and why would we study nature beings? Why is it, you know, is this the anima that appears in dreams? Not necessarily. But what she's saying is that we need to look at how the, an, the, the anima image developed. And you look at the Valkyries of the Nordic and Germanic peoples and, and the water beings and the nymphs of the Celtic peoples and, uh, uh, and the tree numans, uh, tree nymphs. Uh, and, and then out of that comes courtly love, you know, the minna singers, the, um, you know, the frauen dienst, which means to be in service to the feminine, you know, as opposed to the monastery world of being um, in service to the logos. The courtly love was something that came after these more elemental uh, folk tales and legends, uh, you know, and then, and, and, and it was the differentiation and the strength of the anima. But what, what Hillman says, uh, and then I, I'll run on to this, is that consciousness really came out of those feminine energies. And this was um, really um, sensed by Meister Eckhart, you know, uh, 
and here's what Meister Eckhart says, which I think totally evokes Hillman. When the soul or the feminine energies of the anima wishes to experience something, something she throws an image of the experience out before her, the ego consciousness comes out of her. And then she enters her own image. Okay. So the ego thinks the anima is its projection. And Jung's anima told him, no, you are my projection. You are my vehicle to experience time and space. And then after I experience time and space through you, then I'm in full, more informed and, and the a God image can evolve, you know, in, in the inner world, you know. Anyway, uh, this is uh, just, it, it's just something, it's a totally revelation to me. And it gives me a, a better uh, understanding of, uh, if you really want to understand the anima, you need to understand these nature beings, the swan maidens, the uh, water nymphs and the tree nymphs. And uh, then the, the aspect of courtly love. And then um, from there, then maybe you can go on to what is the feeling function? What is that all about? What, what is Eros? You know, um, Eros, uh, Hillman says, is a more immediate experience than the anima, which has this peculiar historical flavor. You know, the Eros and the feeling function are related to the feminine and related to the anima, but the anima is really uh, the personification of the unconscious, which is the personification of psyche and the personification of uh, of nature. Really, unconscious is this, and you know that that list of of energies, which is genuine awareness versus cave awareness. Anyway, um, any. Um, questions or comments on that because i i mean i'm just introducing a little bit of background uh before we get into we're, we're just i think we'll slow not slowly but just deliberately go through some of these tales as annette just um, i don't know if we missed it will be in the youtube she gave us a wonderful uh rendition of uh of uh um angus who is a irish hero who um who became a swan himself? That's the proper uh, uh, to to ex to uh, experience the swan maiden. You need to become a swan yourself. And this word metaphorical uh, means transformation, and it means really that you unite with the anima, and then you become her, and then you go back to time and space. Metaphorical means transformation. Metam Ovid's Metamorphoses, you know, which is a book of transformation, is also describing this process. But anyway, um, go ahead. Yeah, Somebody so, can... you know, what makes sense, but I almost sort of thought of that as Mirren, you know, like where he has to become the swan. So how would you define Mirren then? Well, um, what, what she, what, um, what Emma Young describes it as, and I don't know, say I completely understand it, is the uh, that um, the woman or the anima and the woman are the mirror for man. You know, first of all, man is supposed to be the mirror which held up to the unconscious, so it she can see herself. You know, but then that's what the role of of the non knuckle walking hominids is is to be the mirror to the anima so that she can see herself, you know? Now, as far as the anima being the mirror for ego, you know, that is, um, is also true because its source is nature, you know? It's, it's out here with its cave awareness, which the uh, anima needs to experience time and space, but um, it needs to then come back. And, and what she says is, is women who are more related to the feminine energies have a 
powerful, uh, uh, she says, unbelievable adroitness or cleverness at being the mirror for the male ego, you know, that they, uh, uh, they, they, some, she says, it can go one of two ways that it can either uh, lead to transformation or it can lead to um, uh, the man mirroring himself where it, it's just flattering him and adding to his vanity. And uh, she said, so that's not transformational. The other aspect is, is the one that leads forward. Now I'm saying, I don't c completely understand this. We're gonna need to uh, um, get maybe some research, Jan or something on what mirroring actually means. Yeah, or if anybody has like, uh, you know, fairy tales that they think, yes. you know, kind of show us, that'd be a great way to get a kind of a well, feeling for it. I, I think the way forward is to just finish uh, uh, the, the these um, what we're going to be do, doing we discussed partially the swan maidens last time we're going to finish swan maidens this time start on the water nymphs now <laughs> the water nymphs uh, in its in contrast to the swan maidens the swan maidens want nothing to do with man you know they they are tricked by men stealing their their swan mantle when they uh, take uh, the form of of women to bathe in the, uh, take their bath, then the, the man grabs the swan mantle and, and, uh, and makes a bargain with them for them to marry her. But at the first opportunity, they go back to the swan world. And the only way you can follow them is to become a swan yourself, like Angus did, okay? Now, in contrast to the swan maidens, the water nymphs, these are the um, feminine water beings want a relationship with, uh, uh, with humans, you know, because what they are saying is they, um, even though they look like humans, they were not born of Adam. So they didn't enter time and space. So the only way that they can become a time and space being which they say they live in a soulless world. Now, now this is pretty interesting. The fairies, you know, um, they they live forever. They have no problems. They don't need food. Uh, there's no evil in the fairy world. I mean, they're neutral. You wouldn't. Why would they want anything to do with the human world? Because they lack the promise of youth. You know, if since they live in a timeless world. So what do fairies do? They steal babies, human babies, and they take them back to the fairy hill, okay? And they leave in their place a wizened old elf, you know, who assumes the form of that human baby and becomes a changeling. And, you know, many uh, parents said, oh, no, that's not our baby, I don't think. I think that might be a changeling. You know, and so they 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 had tricks that they could use to tell whether that was a real baby or a changeling. Like they would do something upside down or backwards, and the elves are so curious, or the fairies are so curious that they finally, even they're a baby, will say, "Now, nah, how? Why are you doing that?" Then you know, and then they would tell. They could tell that their baby was a changeling. You know, but anyway, the the whole idea is the water nymphs the water beings, in contrast to the swan maidens, want a relationship with humans, you know? So this is sort of a progress. Then from there, we're going to go into the realm of more the more human, which is the realm of courtly love, you know? Uh, the minna singers and the uh, uh, minna means women, or, you know, it, it's a, as a feminine content. And uh, it was called the age of the Minna Dienst or the Fraun Dienst. And that means that you're in service to the anima, okay, through the woman, you know. And so that was a, a, a further uh, uh, amplification of the anima image uh, starting about in the 12th or 13th century in high contrast to what had become the monk world, you know, the, mon the nurturing of logos uh, underneath. And then you also had alchemy, al 
alchemical uh, wisdom appear uh, in this age too, you know. But anyway, um, any other comments? And by the way, um, uh, uh, Yorga, did you want to introduce yourself or uh, um, anything? You don't have to, but it, you definitely put your email in the uh, in the text, you know. And 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 if you ever have any comments or anything, just unmute and just interrupt. Anybody else have any comments? And then we'll start get getting into the uh, text itself. Um, I'm a little bit curious about the, I assume we'll get into the differences there between the, the water beings and the air beings. Yes. <clears throat> but I'm curious what the character is of that longing for time and space. Why wouldn't the, why wouldn't those beings be perfectly happy in the world without time and space? Because they lack the promise of youth. Okay, but <laughs> what does that provide? I mean, in a timeless world, what's what good is the promise of youth? It's no, there's no nothing happens there. That that that's that that's the uh, you you know sort of the fallacy of of the heavenly world is what Jung called it was a realm of images, you know. It, because um, nothing really happens there. You know, he said, uh, this was in, in memory, dreams, and reflections, that when you die, um, all, everyone gathers around you because they want to smell, you know, the breath of life because they miss it, you know. And, and what he said that, that he found that people do there is that they all seem to be on errands and they can't spend much time uh, talking to you, uh, but they all seem to ha have this spirit of mirth, like they want to share a secret joke. But what he said is, after, and this comes up in the, what is the Day of the Dead in Mexico called? I'm not exactly sure, but um, that, that the, the, the ancestors um, will remain conscious until all memory of them has, has left the uh, living world. And then Jung said that he could discover very, um, you know, relatives, ancestors that had been dead many, many years, you know, maybe a, a few centuries. And they were there, but they were just completely asleep. You know, I mean, he had to sort of wake them up and they were, uh, you know, they, they might, um, you know, become conscious for just a second, but then they drop back down. So what that all means, I'm not sure. But the whole idea is what do you need consciousness for, you know? Um, now, now, this is very interesting, at least my thought on the swan maidens. I don't know if you have any, but the, the swan maidens, which came up in Europe before Christianity, I believe were the natural um, unfolding of the spiritual aspect in in um, pagan Europe, you know, before Christianity, that rather than coming in with this highly spiritual uh, religion of, of, of the Gnostics, you know, it was really a, a, a Gnostic, which I think had something to do with Alexander the Great bringing in um, Indian concepts uh, from uh, Hindu concepts into Alexandria, you know, and then the Gnostics formed and they, they you, you know, they had this relationship with the um, Egyptians who had this physical um, relationship of chemical uh, transformation. And then you, you have the Gnostics come in and that's how you got alchemy. It's the mis mixture of Gnosticism and, the, and these, these people who are expert in chemicals. But then you ask, the question is, why would the, the, this world of the fairies um, want the relationship with time and space and because they long for the light. Now, this is going to come up in the aspect of redemption. In alchemy, you, your soul doesn't need being saved or you don't need to say you don't need being saved. What needs to be redeemed is your soul, which completely lacks ego attention. You know, this is what it says uh, you know, she says, she says, 
do not um do not reject me because I'm black and uh, uh and uh, you know deep down in the mire your lack of of light uh, your lack of attention has made me thus you know and this this also comes up in the pleading uh nature of these uh nature beings in your active imaginations you can easily offend them <laughs> because um they're not used to the conscious world and uh, you know, like uh, Barbara Hanna's Anna, animus told her, or soul told her, your world is as strange to us as ours is to yours. So it, the only way that you can, uh, uh, what Marie-Louise von Franz says is, you know, that your ego needs to get closer and closer to the middle plane. And then they, they will respond, you know, and come closer to the middle plane. And then that's when the philosopher's stone develops this, this temple that is between the timeless world. Now, remember, the timeless world is totally latent. It's totally potentiality. The whole idea is nothing. They don't have linear time there. There isn't one event that is followed by the next event. You know. And Now, it is strange because these myths come out of the uh, 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 inner world, and they have narratives. You know, but they're all already fully formed. They don't unfold in time and space. You know, the the act at thing of things unfolding in time and space is uh, that there's far more drama there and far more unknown. You know, but uh, it it is but you you know the whole Christian myth came in almost completely whole, and then it was added some uh, accretions to it uh, through uh, the eons. But that's uh, through how uh, all myths uh, uh, came about. But anyway, Tim, do you, uh, I would say answer to your question is, why does the inner world, it's because, wh why, did, um, why did Adam and Eve leave? Okay. Wait, it's say that they, again. Why did, why did, Adam, why and did Adam and Eve leave paradise? Okay. It's the same reason the fairies and the inner world wants to be in the outer world. You know, it, it's called um, the fall of man, but it would, and she, Emma Young is going to talk about this, but it really means time begins. Okay. And, and what Young calls the second creation, you know, now he talked about this when he was on the hills of, of the Elgon mountain, looking down at all of the, uh, the, the herds and the flying birds in the plains, you know, he suddenly, it, he had a revelation of what it was like for, um, for um, the, the primate that became um, the hominids, suddenly recognizing, I am here. You know, they, they developed this Archimedean point that can look back at themselves. It's the only difference between you and, and the wonderful orangutan and the wonderful gorilla and the wonderful grizzly bear, they are every bit as conscious, every bit as clever, every bit as sly as you are, you know. But the one thing they don't have is this mirror. Now, remember, Gary, this is another aspect of the mirror. The ego is a mirror that reflects nature back to itself, and then nature can see it. So there is this, mute. it's a double mirror, okay? Now, the self is, is a mirror that looks at the ego and looks at nature. So that's the second mirror. And then there's a third mirror that looks at the self, looking, uh, watching the ego and uh, looking at its nature. You know? So there's supposedly three mirrors. You know? uh, <laughs> but, but the whole idea is, this wonder now now you you know you know the, the one feeling and i'm going to shut up after this unless there's any more questions the one thing i emotion i had in it and this beautiful stories that we're going to read is uh and, and i have the same um feeling about mozart and i have the same feeling about uh the impressionist paintings painters and all art you know and 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 say um, you, you you know just the great poetry 
at one point, our sun is going to become a red giant. And it's going to, Earth is going to burn up like that. Okay. And all of this will be gone. And yet we're here to experience it now. It's absolute, what, what Robinson Jeffers calls divinely superfluous beauty. Now you can see that in the monarch butterfly, in the bower bird, in the tropical birds, in, um, uh, you, you know, this, this uh, you, you know, y- y- um, Joseph Campbell's ma- mentions it in the early, in Neanderthal man would even have a, a, a ceremonial axes, which could not be used as a real ax. They were too large and, and they had this beautiful ceremony. Why did they do that? You know, because it was the master ax, you know? And, uh, and so this aspect of divinely superfluous beauty. So in other words, um, what, what Young, Young says is, is man, is a is the candle that's lit in the darkness of mere being okay it's this light that uh so the the all these wonderful gazing grazing herds and and wandering grizzly bears and orangutans all this wonderful consciousness suddenly there's it can look at itself look back at itself and see what it did and and this age of the romantic uh poets uh, which which greatly influenced Jung uh, was the age when they discovered uh, really that there, that nature had a soul. You know this this is a poem that I really like. Uh, this is um, and now from the vast of the Lord will the waters of sleep roll in on the souls of men. But who will reveal to our waking ken our knowledge the forms that swim and the shapes that creep under the waters of sleep. And w- I would that I could know what swimmeth below when the tides come in. Uh, it's the hymn, uh, I would that I could know what swimmeth below when the tides come in. What swims below us? How did consciousness come into being in the first place? It's just a complete mystery. And then uh, added to that, is this. And what I think the one thing that Emma Young is going to add here as a revelation in this discussion of the nature beings is we need to know this, you know, this is the, she's really providing a history of consciousness. And uh, um, anyway, um, the, you, the, the idea, if, 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 if there hadn't been people, if, 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 the if the if the beauty um, okay now now you know spirit really means the divine and and nature is our bodies and what really is soul is is that the divine shines through our bodies okay you know so it, it is it's the soul that where place where um which which um you know, uh, the Dalai Lama and James Hillman call the veil of tears, the valley. It's not the mountain. It is the valley. That's where soul is. The mountain is where is these, this, uh, um, uh, air, uh, you know, this air place is, is, is represents the divine, but that's what the soul lets shine through nature, you know? So anyway, I, that's kind of my, myth of creation <laughs> i don't know i i didn't invent it myself but uh you know well anyway um any other comments and then we'll uh jump into uh just yes, look at a couple you, yeah go ahead I just say, my own impression is like why do you have to become a swan is that because they are so different from us is that that's a way of connecting and that's all yes. because they need to learn from our world or the the, the swans need to learn from your world and, mm-hmm. and vice versa. And, and mm-hmm. But because they're so different, we need to, uh, to, to develop this kind of receptivity that we have some kind of communication because normally we don't, mm-hmm. I think. Well, well, and remember that just, uh, I'm just look at this one more time, is what, what Hillman calls genuine awareness. 
this all has to do with the unconscious world. There's nothing about this, this thing that's rejected by ego is all the unconscious becoming conscious. All of this is. This, this is genuine awareness is what Hillman calls, you know, in other words, it's this, this, this realm up here at the top. This is, this is the realm uh, of, of uh, real awareness. You know, this realm down here is the one we live in, you know, and it's informed by this, you know, these things here on the left. You know, and the idea of letting the eternal shine through the latent world, the one of potentiality, is we need this on the left to be very strong so that this thing on the right can become manifest in the world. I mean, the, the whole idea of, of a dream, which comes from this world, what, what it requires or ask, and it'll be an unopened letter if, unless you do, is for, for ego to provide two things. Here's ego over here. To provide two things. To provide the expression of the dream. To write it down. To paint it. To do something to express it and make it real and concrete in the outer world. And Jung says, after you do that, you will never be the same. The next dream will respond to what you've done. And so it leads somewhere. But then you add meaning to it, to the expression. And meaning comes from the, the, the world of um, the, this, this world. Now, this is, see, this is the animus. What the animus's great value is, is to provide meaning through its ability to differentiate and order. Through its ability to differentiate and order, it is able to provide a meaning that is not uh, available in these raw unconscious contents. You know, so uh, that, that is the, uh, the role of the logos and the animus. So when the logos becomes its own, uh, you know, which I think it became in the monasteries, just considering the same thing over and over again, you know, a dead text, which was frozen in time in words, not, not, um, not um, like this. Let me just show you. Here's, here's one that's not, here's a religion that is never dead. And uh, this one. And this I brought up several times, but for the Nascapi Cree, a major obligation was to follow the instruction given by his dreams, the one he had last night, and then give permanent form to their contents and art. And who was receptive to the hints of Mr. Peo, the companion, uh, would get better and more helpful dreams. And this companion also becomes more real within. Now, this is the act, ob, ob, object of alchemy, is to uh, redeem that um, unconscious being within us who lacks our attention. Our attention is light, so she's black, because we don't give her our light. The more light we give her, the, the more uh, real she becomes. And she uh, actually arises from those steps. And then if you stop, you, you were doing it for a while, you're doing your, chemical, your active imaginations and things, and then you stop, she goes back like that. You know, so it's a constant process. But anyway, um, that is uh, sort of uh, what we're doing here. I mean, I really think it is, is uh, it's, it's just a, I, and, and you know, none of this really, that's why I say, if we go through this book, and then we go through the anima, uh, uh, the, uh, through you know what Hillman is is really good at uh, is this is he um, is this person who takes nothing for granted, and and you know whatever happens, he um, looks the not what it being said, but what energies lie behind what's being said, and he reminds me of this guy. I mean, he's, he's a truth bomb. 
And, uh, you know, I mean, he just brings, uh, and, and he still, he makes all the, this thing. Young did the same thing. And Joseph Campbell were these um, undecipherable um, myth. You know, he, he suddenly said, oh, that's related to me. Not, it, it has nothing to do with the outer world. But um, Hillman is just particularly, at least the early Hillman. I don't think the later Hillman, I think he, started to read his own press or whatever but anyway let's let's get just get into a uh, a, a um, um, one of his uh, uh, water uh, well we'll finish there's one uh, left on the uh, Swan maiden um, and then we're going to do some on the water beings and then we're going to do uh, I think one on the a tree nymph but um, the the um, you, you know, he mentioned she's mentioning the prophetic abilities of women. Uh, why? Uh, the, but really, it's just what we've been talking about is the 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 um, remember that I, the, the aspect of that right hand side of the list never changes. The aspect of the left hand side of the list is always developing, progressing, strengthening, reality testing all the time. But this side is a fixed point. And what it is doing is trying to communicate with this realm it created. Now, remember what Meister Eckhart said, that the soul threw this image out before it, the ego, and let it develop. And now it's entering back into it. You know, So it's participating in time and space. The whole ontological reason for human beings was what Jung said that here the whole um, uh, history of 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 the hominids on Earth was the progressive incarnation of a deity. You know the progressive incarnation of the informing wisdom of nature, which wanted a mirror so it could see itself. Now this is something Alan Watts, you know, the Zen philosopher, talks a lot about. You know that. Uh, this rock called earth peopled so that the stars could see themselves. What do you think about that? You know, he, he said that like an apple tree apples, the earth peopled and then the people could see the, the star that wanted to see itself, see what it looked like, you know? So, I mean, Alan Watts had some, sort of the same vision, you know? Um, you know, Alan Watson and Young met, by the way. Uh, I'll tell you the story real quick. Is uh, uh, Young, uh, there's somebody, the Young family that was having a birthday party and they were having a kind of a, 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 a group dinner there, you know. And then suddenly uh, somebody jumped the fence and went across the lawn and comes in to the party and says, are you... C.G. Young, and he says, yes, I am. He says, I'd like to have a word with you. <laughs> so then they go out and they talk for about an hour. And then Young comes back and says, that was one of the most uh, permeable people I've ever met. It was Alan Watts. <laughs> he jumps the fence and crashes a party to go talk to Young. But anyway, we're, now we're going to just talk about um, this one more um, uh, the last Swan Maiden uh, tale. And the reason we're going to talk about it is because it comes up with the aspect of the redemption of our source, which wants to be conscious in the outer world. And the only way it can become conscious in the outer world is for that left hand uh, uh, selection of qualities to, um, to, to be very strong but to surrender its strength and listen to the right hand side, you know, of the uh, the images, and we saw that big list. We don't, I don't understand them all yet, but uh, maybe we can um, gradually get to know them a little better. But anyway, it's a woodsman who's on a track of a deer, uh, and it reached a lake as three white swans came flying up. Immediately, they turned into three fair maidens who bathe in uh, the lake. But after a while, they emerged from the water and flew away as swans. He could not um, 
get uh, these maidens off his mind. And so he comes back uh, three days later and finds them bathing again. He creeps up and takes the swan mantle, the youngest one. She implores him to give it back, but he pretends to be deaf, takes it home, and the maid follows him. And uh, she's received in a friendly way by his people and agrees to marry her. But um, there's always a condition uh, to marrying the, the anima. And uh, it's always violated and always unintentional. But that is the crisis that then you go like Parsifal, you, you don't get it on the first chance that you're gonna screw up on the first uh, visit to the grail. Then you have to go back and get it uh, really. And uh, that and that is what Annette was telling us about Angus, you know. So anyway, uh, she comes back. Uh, everyone's friendly to her. Um, you know, uh, she's uh, marries him, um, and they lived happily together for several years. Um, at he, the man gave the swan mantle to his mother. Now the mother usually in, in several of these ones, she's the one who gives the anima the, that thing back, which causes uh, her to leave. Now, uh, Emma Young says you can interpret that two ways. Either the mother does not want her son to develop, you know, this is the typical image, or she says, this is actually the great mother who wants her children to return to her, you know. But usually it is the mother, the mother's tidying up, uh, founds, finds the chest where the swan mantle is, opens it, and as soon as the young woman caught sight of her swan mantle, uh, she threw it hurriedly around her, and with the words, he who wants to see me again must come to the glass mountain that stands on the shining field, and sw swings herself in the air and flies away, and then the unhappy hunter goes to seek her, and with the assistance of friendly animals, and after many difficulties, finally founds her. And then he finds that she's enchanted and he helps her get rid of the enchantment. So this is, um, introduces this concept of redemption. You know, the uh, idea that, uh, you know, you're, um, it's, it's really the idea of aletheia, you know, that when we're born, we, the soul and our ego are one, and but when when we enter time and space, the the soul remains where it was, and it's only the ego that goes into time and space, but it forgets everything it knew before. So uh, really, it's unenchanting itself. When he's unenchanting, or you know, removing the enchantment of the anima, he's really removing the enchantment from himself. You know, so that he can unite with her, you know. And uh, uh, so anyway, um, he's, um, I don't know, I better keep an eye. <laughs> I've blown this whole hour away. But anyway, um, so uh, the, she, the problem is to redeem her. And, and it, this uh, appears in so many fairy, fairy tales, you know, that the anima is enchanted and needs redemption. I really think it's the, it's the hero who lives in the ego realm, who through the help of animals finds the anima through help of nature, finds the anima and then um, uh, uh, removes the curse or something that separates him from his own source, his own nature and his own soul so that now he can be conscious of it. That means he's become a swan. And united with her you know now this is the idea of active imagination what we're doing in active imagination is we're trying to become swans you know i mean we're going in there and we're softening up this horrible left hand side of us you know so that it becomes more receptive to or what young says the difference between me and everybody else is to what them is opaque is to me transparent 
you know, and uh, so what he does is he becomes permeable to the to the depths, you know, and where we because our uh, the light of ego is so harsh. And by the way, you know, Emma Young says this, and so does Marion Weber. All of us, men and women, are um, not feminine enough. The only way that we're going to get back to this world is to all become very feminine, you know. And and the idea is uh, is is um, to uh, live in the present moment, to be receptive, to um, be reflective, to uh, to uh, resonate. Uh, you, you know, all of this um, idea uh, of 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 entering the realm of images, being open to it, you know? But anyway, I kind of blew this hour away. I'm sorry, but it was kind of a fun discussion. But um, Gary, do you want to just, uh, well, I guess I got five more minutes. Let's, let me just uh, finish if there's anything else here. Okay, the redemption is achieved by recognizing and integrating the unknown elements of soul. Okay, by going and looking for her, he has recognized and integrated these unknown elements, soul, and uh, um, the re and the reason that they're um, unrecognized is because they're undifferentiated and unconscious. That is, they're in their natural state, you know, and therefore, uh, you know, there's this this very close relationship with the inferior function, the soul. Uh, are have a very uh, are the same thing. The only way to redeem them is to become uh, conscious of them because we're unconscious of them. But then they're the door to to the inner world because um, uh, they are unadop unadapted to the outer world. Okay, anything that is unadapted to the outer world in its natural state still possesses the wisdom of nature. You know, so the inferior function and the anima who's a nature being, a natur wesson, you know, is um, in every fairy tale. What happens is that is the um, uh, there is a quest, and the quest is is the redemption of of our, our soul in almost every case. And the um, uh, there's three sons, you know, and the, the two favored sons of the king always fail because they take the straight path. And uh, they are using a direct thinking of the of King Ego to comp to force an outcome. You know, where the uh, the rejected son, the one who's the fool, it, it isn't um, uh, isn't so adapted to that realm of the King Ego, and so it uses animal helpers. And the serpentine path, that's how we redeem our soul because really our soul is nature. How do we rediscover nature? You know, and that's uh, this idea of uh, um, this thing uh, here, which I just love is this. I mean, I just listen to it again and again and again. You know, a, a pagan heart. But a Christian soul had he. He followed Christ, yet for nature he sighed. For dead nature he sighs. You know, the, the, the problem with Christianity is uh, not Christianity, but let's just say the Logos world. Doesn't we don't have to denigrate anything? Is it is um it is it's not connected with, with our bodies and our nature. I think while we're alive, all of our wisdom is in our, all the dreams come out of the marrow of our bones, out of the cells of our body, out of our blood, out of our heart, out of our lungs, and out of our stomachs and our digestive system. That's where the dreams come. And that's the wisdom of nature, and we've got it right in ourselves. So that's where all our animal helpers are. All of our animal <laughs> helpers. And, that, and so anytime in a dream where you descend, you're descending into nature. 
you're descending into your own body, you know? And that's the one who can give you the answers because it is informed who, you know, that's one, one thing uh, I was uh, in an act of imagination. I was uh, coming in there with this, you know, this tremendous knot of light right here, you know, and uh, I'm coming in. So I'm t full of doubts. What in the hell am I doing here? And I, I asked the great mother, you know, I said, could you get rid of this doubt in my head? And she says, um, who do you think you are? She says, who do you think created this consciousness you have? Who created your body? Who created your fingernails and gave you sight through your eyes and hearing through your ears? Well, anyway, let me turn over to you to Gary because I got do barking dogs here. <laughs> Just uh, let's hear from everybody if we can. Just any comments about anything, you know, let's just go around the room. Okay. So, uh, Tim, do you want to do you want to start? Man, I'm just uh, continually fascinated with the unfolding of those inner spirits. Like, for instance, the, the idea of there being a thousand animas and we have to pick the right one. Um, you know, the, the, the distinction between those different entities is really fascinating to me. I've, as I get older, I see that, that there is a kind of uh, delineation between the different aspects of my anima and my inner characters. And uh, all of this stuff is just really fascinating to me and how, how that becomes unfolded and one part is distinguished from another. So it's... Uh, it's just continually a great meditation element for me to come back to this over and over in different ways and, and try to apply a little bit of consciousness to each side of the idea. So um, it's just very, very rich and I'm grateful for the opportunity. It's your soul. It's not this guy's soul and that guy's soul. You know, that comes up in, an, in another one, a dream that we're, or thing we're going to have that uh he wants to marry this this water nymph and the the water her father the water nymph's father comes up and then two of these women come up says if you can find out which one uh is uh the real your real soul then you can marry her but not unless you can distinguish between them you know yeah. and for me one one real really interesting parallel right there is um, those of you who've seen my visitation by the muse uh, video, there's this young woman that I met 30 years ago, who um, who was really the face of my anima. And interestingly enough, several years later, I found in a friend's house hanging a portrait of a woman who looked exactly the same. And she was born a hundred years earlier in this town and other people have come in and seen her photograph and mistaken her for, for my friend. And they both, one, one was named Elisa and the woman who was born a hundred years ago, her name was Elsa Elisa Elias. Wow. And, and so it's, it's very much this same dichotomy. Here are these two women with, with seemingly the same face, a hundred years apart. And part of my task is to, is to make that distinction, you know, to come up with the, um, the truth of what, what it is that dwells within me. Yeah, that, that is, uh, you know, after reading this thing by Anna, Anna Young, you, you know, I, I've had COVID all week. <laughs> I'm just get up, got off quarantine today. I mean, we actually did have, have both my wife and I. But so I wasn't doing my active imaginations, you know, but um, with which I try to do about at least 45 minutes a day, uh, which is I call the blessed hour too. But 
through reading all this and with and with Hillman, because I couldn't do my active imagination, I just didn't feel I could uh, focus that way anymore, uh, being so ill. And um, is I just suddenly realized that this anima is nature herself, you know. And uh, I'm going to have a little more respect for her next time I uh, meet her. But anyway, go go keep going, Gary. Yeah, uh, Annette, would you uh, like to make a comment? Yeah, it's just lovely to be part of, 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 of this discussion. And, and yeah, thank you all. It's, it's wonderful to listen to it. And I hope you have recovered, Greg, as well from your COVID. How about you, uh, Camelia? Did you say something? Yeah, would you, uh, would you like to make a, a comment? Yes, well, um, I've been thinking very much of an experience that I've had for about 10, 11 years, which uh, has been, I suppose, a kind of understanding a procession, an anima procession, if I may call it that, um, which was predicted almost by 10 months in advance of meeting this person. Um, and the way we, we couldn't get one another in sort of in real life, if you like, but we developed a kind of language and certainly I developed a written language through which I have, I suppose it reminisces a little bit about of the active imagination or, um, yeah, I think it's taken that sort of space for me because all of the myths and the sort of allusions you did to the water nymphs and sort of, I've been through it all. I've been a fish, I've been water. You know? It's been really, and I've let myself go with the flow just to sort of also understand my, the animus part, because obviously um, an anima and an animus is, I suppose is different depending on the man or the woman. And also what, who was my animus in relation to this man that I fell in love with? And uh, well, it's just been fascinating to see the kind of both adventure, but also the kind of nature that I have become through my writing, through allowing myself to become whatever was the procession, either by him or by myself on him. You know, I, I'm completely sort of in awe of the space that was created between us. Um, and um, in a way, luckily we couldn't get one another because I think we would have ruined each other because it was so forceful, but we were able to create this very sort of luminous language, if you like, um, yeah. Kind of a secret communication, you know, it's just this wonderful uh, soul to soul, you mm. know, and, and it actually then your soul gets the chance to speak, you know. Absolutely. I, I think too, uh, you know, the idea is that your hands speak with a different consciousness than your mouth does. You know. Yeah, I agree. Yes. Head. You know, and and so uh, you know, for instance, when my wife writes anything, it's just so incredibly deep. You know, and uh, and so I think something else is coming out there, and you know, that's what Barbara Hanna says: that don't worry that you think that you invented it, you'll find out pretty soon you didn't. You had, there, there are statements that are made in writing of that type that you look back and you say, I could never have said that. That yeah. did not come from here. It yeah, because from... I, can't, I can't remember very well when I speak, for example, I was impressed by you remembering the word Alethea. <laughs> I was thinking, yes. oh my gosh, he's thinking and remembering. Uh, I yes. can never do that. They were, I can recall them when I write, but I cannot think them into my words when I speak. This is a very interesting, I've been observing this a lot. So, but in writing, it's, it's really fluent and even more, I mean, more than I ever thought was possible. Yeah, it's interesting that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Camilla. Yeah, Go ahead. Just, well, just thank you. Too. <laughs> um, Jorge, would you uh, like to say anything? 
Well, thanks for the welcoming. I um, I live in Mexico City. I I, I don't have any uh, so much to say about this. Uh, this is my my first session, but I um, I felt this uh, call when I see the group in Facebook, and I I am pleased to see what I'm seeing here. So I hope to follow the next readings. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. I, I mean, I hope you come back. Uh, it's, uh, I can just, you're, just those few words uh, kind of awoke something in me. So go, go ahead, Gary. Oh, yeah. No, I agree. Uh, Miles, uh, do you have anything to say? Hi. Yeah, I do. Um, welcome, Jorge. I'm, I'm on the north side of the United States. I'm in Canada. So I'm putting... The, everything we are talking about, I'm taking us into the Canadian context. And my work began with uh, reading what is referred to as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's summary report of 2015, which is testimonies of Indigenous people and the effects of the residential schools. Basically, they were more like work camps they weren't residential and people didn't reside there. They were uh, indigenous children forcibly taken from their parents to be indoctrinated in the logos, basically. You know, I could say now that I know this word logos better. And our failure to recognize the indigenous people possessing the genuine awareness that that um, Craig has presented here today. And um, so this word reconciliation is one that I've had to figure out, well, what does that mean? And uh, uh, how do we reconcile? And obviously this, uh, my learning from Craig and others about the soul is, uh, and redeeming the soul is, integral, it's inseparable from reconciliation. And so um, a couple of notes I also have here that, um, you know, as Craig mentioned in every story, it's about a quest to redeem, rediscover our soul. And coincidentally, coincidentally, I chose quest 3210 back in when I first decided I need to maybe start something on my own. This is going back to 2014, I'm thinking. Um, so quest is a word that comes up for me. You know, this is a quest we are on. And I'm trying to always say we because my education is from you, you know, and everyone here. And um, what I'll say as well uh, something recently that I encountered on Laura London's website speaking of young I'm pretty sure the most recent episode an interview of Lewis Morris a Jungian analyst and filmmaker now living and working in Zurich I believe in this interview he says Wolfgang Pauli um, points out uh, that uh, or it's out of quantum physics Wolfgang Pauli did um, incredible work in the area of quantum physics and says that time and space are actually one. And, you know, that's again, a real struggle for us to get our heads around it, but it's part of genuine awareness and it's at a higher metaphysical perspective than I'm typically able to grasp. But it occurs to me, um, and I'm not sure if he says it as well in this interview, that not only time and space on the horizontal, but synchronicity and causality on the vertical. Why aren't, wouldn't those be one too? So in other words, every moment, is a causality and at the same time a synchronicity if we go deep enough. So, you know, for example, today Craig 
presented the image of the West Coast Native people of uh, North America as a, as a photo, and uh, then the Nascapi people of Labrador in Eastern and Northern Canada. And um, Kim and I are very interested in learning more about the, Nis the Nitsitapi people, the Blackfoot's Blackfeet Confederacy where we live. And they have their Blackfoot metaphysics, which is, again, I would say this genuine awareness. And uh, the tragedy is for our, our um, the newcomers to North America um, failing to appreciate genuine awareness, being stuck in the logos and thinking that the Indigenous people need to be indoctrinated into our way of thinking. Um, Blackfoot metaphysics, uh, Dr. Leroy Little Bear, they say that spirit is energy, energy is spirit. And they also, the Nietzsche people also recognize all of our relations, which is what Craig is talking about here today, all of our relations, and that the animals are our relations and the animals have spirit and the animals have lessons for us to teach us. And um, so with that, I guess I'm complete. Thank you. Yeah, it, you, you know, who tells the, uh, all the, when there's about a tsunami about ready to occur or an earthquake is, who tells the animals uh, what to do? I mean, they all head for higher ground before the tsunami even comes. Or who tells, who tells the hummingbird to, how to fly from Central America to our backyard the same hummingbirds every year. I mean, it's, uh, you, you know, I saw these, uh, I was in the park and there was this snake, everybody's gathered around watching this snake go up the tree, you know, and they're saying, what kind of snake is that? You know, and I said, well, I'm not really sure, but you know why it's going up there? And he said, no. And he says, because master snake told him that he could maybe find a bird's nest up there, you know, hold him in a dream, you know, so he's going up there to see if, if it's true, you know, but I, I mean, the whole idea is, and you, you know, I, I, I just want to say this, is, this is, this is something I, I think uh, with my wife is, do you know, nature treats every species as if it's absolute favorite species. And that every other species is an enemy in a lot of cases. You know, the porcupine. Why do we need a porcupine? Why does he need that kind of defense? Or the skunk, you know, that shoots out the, the thing. I mean, this unbelievable defenses. And, and you know, the idea of we, our dogs keep getting burrs and we can't get them out of the fur. And I said, well, that's the master uh, burr. He wants to make sure that that seed gets laid somewhere so and, and i'll tell you something else. i'm just tell you one other thing my wife has these two plants one's here one's here and this one has a vine plant the vine uh, this one's kind of out of the sunlight the vine goes up there's a hole in the bottom of the other pot the vine goes up to the hole in the bottom of the other pot and goes up through that pot and comes out on top now she says I said, don't touch that. I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful. But I mean, anyway, it's this consciousness. Now, now one thing in, in, in Canada, and, and I think a lot of the, um, the Western tribes um, who, uh, I think it's still in case in a lot of the Eastern tribes of North America, but they, um, they have um, their, they still, have a living, growing, developing myth, you know, and that's why when you read um, about these uh, schools, it, the lament of there comes through. It's not the lament. It, it you are listening to the beauty of their own myth when they're presented with this soulless world of the. Uh, of the schools, you know, that has no soul. Anyway, 
Keep going, Gary. <laughs> yeah, so we got a, a question from Camilla uh, in the chat. And it reads, if myths are not unfolding in time and space, why are they applied into a traditional narrative structure? I think you, you muted yourself. I know, I got to. Okay, that is a wonderful question. And it is, why are dreams in narratives? Why do dreams have a setting? certain people in the dream, crisis occurs, uh, it, and then it's either resolved or not resolved. You know, why does that, uh, how does that come up? Now, the, the thing is that the myth has this drama in it, but it came from uh, the, uh, it came from the timeless realm, okay? Because, now, Young uh, had this one patient one time that would uh, that would come and just make up his dreams, you know, and he kept doing it for about a year. And uh, uh, finally, he says, tells Young, he says, you know, these aren't my real dreams. I just been making them up. He said, oh, I knew that on the first one. <laughs> and the idea is, is the dream has an unmistakable so does the myth. And when you hear it, you feel a, um, okay, I just want to say, I don't know if you guys work on your dreams, okay? If you take a dream, and what I usually do is I just list, I take the dream and I list each thing. And then I, for each item in the dream, I just write something. And then I write something after for the next thing and you know at first the dream just is, seems so garbled but then it it just absolutely falls into place and the 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 thing i want to mention is while i'm doing this i feel a inner feeling like i feel in no other activity i do and the in the act of imagination the soul says that's because i'm with you that's when I am with you. You're feeling me when you do that. And that's why, you know, I call it the blessed hour. But I mean, the idea of dealing with genuine contents. This, this is what Marie-Louise von Franz says. Fairy tales are absolutely priceless because we are dealing with an X-ray of the psyche. It possesses all four functions and it also possesses the wisdom of nature in it. And it came, where did it come from? No person could have written that. And it, what, what the unconscious does, you know, like if you have start having a dream, Gary's been having dreams about wearing masks all the time. What, what, what it does is it takes the images of the outer, it, it has eyes that see things you don't see. It has ears that hears things you don't hear. And it says, oh, listen, Look, that happened to you yesterday. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of, of how uh, soulless you are. And let me show you uh, through that analogy um, how you're going the wrong way. You know, the idea is that the one who writes the dreams, the one who writes the myths is your root, your rhizome, this huge, massive root that lies under the ground. And you're just this little green shoot that comes out of it, you know? And the, the idea is the dream is the rudder to try to get you going on, on the right uh, path. And you don't, you're not the, and so when you have a dream about a car, a lot of times, I've said this last time, that the, who's driving the car? It's not you, someone else is driving. It's like a house, but this one has motion. But who's steering it? And where does the energy come from? This is psyche uh, dr driving the car. And it's showing you uh, either that you're going in the wrong direction, you're going to crash, or that, uh, uh, you know, often I would, I would feel, uh, you know, there'd be a big uh, cover on the front of the windshield. I can't see anything. And yet the car doesn't have a crash. And it's just telling me, hey, don't worry, 
I'm driving this thing, not you. You're not the master in your own house. But anyway, the, the idea of where did myths come from? Where did fairy tales come from? Where do dreams come from? That This should be mind-blowing to us because um, they, they it, no, uh, the, the, the Jews say, because they recognize this, God created man because he loves a story, okay? If God loves a story, he does love a story. You know, that's what Jung calls the, uh, uh, the, uh, the afterlife and the unconscious. He calls it a realm of images. It's real. But now, the, the, the one, uh, I'll say one other thing, is the, the dream that came to the snake that went up the tree and the dream that comes to the grizzly bear is the same dream you have, you know? It, it, it presents the dream in the same fashion. The only, uh, you know, uh, development is now there are words. And there's also the aspect of meaning. You know, I mean, the idea of the incarnation of the deity is to evolve the God image and everything. So our dreams uh, have an aspect um, uh, of this, and, and I'll tell you, uh, this is. Uh, the, let me just show you real quick because this is, this is, this is going to tell you a little bit about the the in uh, the what myths are, okay, and what dreams are. Let me see if I can get this here. Now, th this is uh, about Nicodemus, um, who is mentioned in, I believe, it's in the Gospel of John. But anyway, he has this dream that there's a burning tree. It's an alchemical transforming tree. This tree bears fruit, okay? And when this fruit is harvested, that's the, the fruit is us, okay? You're a piece of fruit on this tree. This is the tree of life, of the tree of the ancestral wisdom, okay? When, when uh, the fruit uh, has been um, harvested, it's stored in a vast storehouse with all the fruit that has ever been harvested in all the ages. It's this eternal storehouse of fruit. And each piece of fruit has its own resonance that forever alters the fruit that comes after. You know, and, and the idea, that's the evolution of God image. You have that resonance. Goethe had that resonance. You know, it was the world the same after Goethe. You know, was the world the same after Picasso or James Joyce, you know, or uh, Young or Joseph Campbell? Uh, you, you know, there's just this idea of, uh, of these, these transformational characters. But anyway, the, the idea is that they, I think also, this is just my theory, is that the, the evolution is forward thinking. You know, I mean, it... it it isn't um, cause and effect, it's synchronicity and a causality. And it, it sees a niche, it fills it, you know? And, and the proof I have of this is uh, one time I was in Shedd's Aquarium and I see a, uh, uh, a seaweed uh, seahorse. You know, I'm gonna get rid of this. Oh, I got to unsh- oh yeah. <laughs> Um, and it has the same weeds, seaweed growing out of its body as it lives in, okay? Now, how did that happen? You know, I mean, here, here's the, the seaweed seahorse floating through the, the same seaweeds growing on its body. I mean, the idea is that um, uh, it's just this divinely superfluous beauty or whatever. The DNA is... is uh, is uh, of you, your life changes the DNA of everybody else that ever lived. And, and Edinger was really into this too, because he said the idea of uh, when you, people who've experienced past lives, he says they didn't really experience the past life or live the past life. This was his theory, okay? And Jeffrey Raff, by the way, I told him this, and he says, well, that was his theory. You know, he, he did, wasn't buying it. But this was Edinger's theory, is that, um, you know, you 
uh, an archetype awakens in you that very powerfully that also was um, uh, awakened this person very powerfully. So when you open that, that, that portal so wide, uh, there was also this portal and those memories suddenly flew into your, or fell into your consciousness. And so suddenly you can say, well, I know it, it was 300 years ago and they lived on this street and they had 11 kids, five were boys and six were girls. And one of them uh, married a princess, uh, you know, <laughs> and then somebody goes back and looks and it's exactly as they described. But, but the whole idea is, uh, is now here's the other thing, Camilla, and I'm going to shut up about this story stuff, is the, um, the, 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 this is how some people, you, you know, uh, Miles said that the time and space are one, okay? Our, our vision of linearity, the linearity of time, one moment following another is an illusion. This Albert Einstein told us this, you know? And, and so our book is, uh, is already written, you know? Um, that, you, you know, people who can, um, like, like um, who was it, Nostradamus, or, or even say the, um, the uh, astrological people who said that we were going to be, I mean, this was back probably in the age of Horus the ball, and then you went through Aries and Pisces, and then the next one is going to be the water bear. They defined the um, unfolding of the evolution of the God images, okay? 5,000 years ago, okay? So there's this idea of that um, all, everything that has ever happened and everything that's going to happen happened in, in, a, in, in sort of a random way, but it, it actually, everyone, um, that, that history is, is all in one book. So you're on page 203 of a 400 page book. Well, page 400 is, exists somewhere. You know, now, I don't know that, that, whether that means anything, but you know, when people can uh, foresee something that's going to happen, uh, you know, with this deja vu and everything that happens, there is an aspect that, um, that, that suddenly they became permeable to um, get out of the linearity of time. And so suddenly um, the, the, uh, all of time was available to them at once. And, this, and it just so happened that that particular event fell into your awareness, you know? So anyway, um, it's, uh, it's a, it is uh, God created man because he loves a story. And every myth is a story. Every myth has Frank, a, a drama. Yes, go ahead. I was just wondering if you would, could Google and bring up an image of a piece of work by an American artist named Barnett Newman. It's called Voice of Fire. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could present that. All right. Well, what, Gary, why don't you ask somebody? Uh, yeah. Going. So, uh, Angel, do you have uh, do you have any comments? Are you there, Angel? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if Angel is has the ability to yeah. speak. How about right? you, Don? Do you do you have anything you want to say? And maybe you could uh, stop the recording. Yeah, I'm gonna stop the recording so Jan can participate. Uh, Carlos, do you have do you have anything you want to say? And I'll go over to Jan. So yeah, Carl's second, I'm gonna stop the recording.